All right. So again, this morning, um, I was really just praying, asking, not even asking God. I was just praying. That's the cool thing about God. He'll tell you what you need to know in the moment. So like I was saying this morning, I just heard the Lord speak to me and just said three simple words, prepping for victory. And that's the, um, that's the message for today. That's the, the theme of today is preparing ourselves for victory. So when we hear this, we think automatically, oh, we went, we're winning the battle, we're winning the battle, and that's all true. But there's steps that we have to take that will prepare ourselves for victory. So the two scriptures that I love the most about victory, and you will always hear me quote them. The first one is 1 Corinthians 15, 57. And it says, but thanks be unto God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then the second one is 2 Corinthians 2, 14. That says, now thanks be unto God, who always causes us to triumph in Christ, and who makes manifest through us the savor of his knowledge in every place. So the beginning part of this scripture, I always quote, now thanks be unto God, who always causes us to triumph. But today I was just meditating on the second part of this scripture that says, who makes manifest through us, through you the savor of his knowledge in every place. So trying to understand this scripture, savor, the word savor means an aroma. So the word there says, may, who made manifest through us the savor of his knowledge in every place. So what this phrase means, it's the aroma of his knowledge and that's being manifested through us in every place through him causing us to triumph. So through him healing us and us triumphing over sickness, the knowledge of him being a healer is now manifested through us. Does that make sense? So through us, through him delivering us and causing us to triumph, let's say over mental illness and those ungodly thoughts, now through now the knowledge of him taking the crown of thorns on his head is now manifested through us does that make sense guys so through us triumphing in this life god now manifests who he truly is through us right so this is why we are able to triumph because it's not in us at ourselves we don't have the ability to be able to overcome this world we don't have the ability to overcome temptations in ourself but it's the god in us that's able to do this right so prepping for victory that's the name of this this message and that's the the word god gave us so the other thing that god told me too today that i thought was pretty cool is because again, when we hear about prepping for victory, we, we, we think about all the good times, we think about overcoming and just coming on the other side. But God said the only way that you can prep for victory is if you're prepped for battle. So the only way that you're prepped for victory is if you're prepped for battle. You're not victorious if you did not overcome the struggle, right? If I'm dealing with a pornography issue, I I'm not victorious unless I conquer that thing. So to be able to have victory, I have to go through the trial. I have to overcome the trial. So to have victory, to be prepped for victory, you have to first be prepped for battle. So a soldier, a soldier is someone who is, who not only, a, so, a soldier is someone that does not represent himself but rather he's one who represents on behalf of something or someone else. If you ask a Marine, if you ask an army man, if you ask a military man who they represent, they will never say they represent themselves, but they will say they represent their country. They're fighting on behalf of their country. They're fighting on behalf of this nation. And the same thing is for you. Each and every one of us are a soldier enlisted in the army of the Lord, right? So we are not able to represent ourselves, but you represent the King of Kings and you represent the kingdom of God. So, and even an ambassador, right? Let's, let's look away from the, the um, soldier part. Even an ambassador, 
An ambassador does not represent himself when he goes to another nation or another country, but rather he represents the king and the country where he comes from. He represents the king and the kingdom which he comes from. And you, the Bible says, are an ambassador of Christ. Each and every one of you, you do not again represent yourself, but you being an ambassador of Christ, you're on assignment of the king of kings. As an ambassador, you speak on behalf of the king and not only on behalf of the king, but you speak as the king here on earth, right? You're able to execute judgment here on earth on behalf of the king through the authority that Jesus has given you. This is deliverance, right? We're in this deliverance ministry. You being a soldier in the army, you being an ambassador, because you're an ambassador, you speak on behalf of the king and you speak as the king because only the king can execute judgment, but you being an ambassador and us being here on earth representing Jesus, you have the authority to execute judgment against the kingdom of a darkness and you can speak death to his kingdom because you're representing the king of kings. So in the name of Jesus, when you command Satan to bow, he has to bow because you're not speaking on your own behalf, but you're speaking on behalf of Jesus. Amen. Don't get me preaching here, man. Let me tell you, this thing is very important for each and every one of us to know because you do not realize what you carry within you. You don't realize the power and the authority that you carry. And the thing is, is that we here on earth, you're here to conquer the kingdom of darkness and now release life through the kingdom of light that is within you. Amen. Because there's two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. Who do you represent today? What covering are you under today? Second Timothy 2 verses 3 and 4 says, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And any man that wars entangles himself not with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. So you being also a soldier in the army of God, you do not entangle yourself with the affairs of this life. Amen. You are not to be like the world. You can't be sitting in the bars like everyone else does. You can't be in the strip clubs like everybody else can. You can't be partying every other weekend, every weekend, like, like the whole world does because you're a soldier. You cannot entangle yourself with the affairs of this life because you are to please the one who has chosen you to be a soldier. So how do you please the one that chose you, that chose you to be the soldier? It's in the beginning part of this scripture that says enduring hardness as a good, as a good soldier. So you being a soldier, you're going to have to endure what is being thrown at you from the world. But through you enduring through your faith in God, through exercising the authority that God has given you, you're not going to entangle yourself or associate yourself with the things of this world, but rather you're going to conquer the enemy. And through you enduring through the trial, nobody said the trial was going to be easy, but by you enduring through your faith and putting your trust in Jesus, you're now going to be able to please the one who has put you on assignment as that soldier. Amen. So 1 John uh, chapter 5, verse 4 says, For whosoever is born of God overcomes this world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So when you have faith in God, the same faith that you believe saved you from darkness, the same faith that you believe saved you and plucked you up from the miry clay and the pits of hell. That is the same faith that gives you victory to over the temptation of the world and now gives you the authority and power to overcome it. Your faith empowers you to overcome, amen? It's the faith that you put in God that empowers you to be an overcomer. I don't care what you're going through. You have the power within you to overcome what you're going through today. Greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. And the same power that rose Jesus from the dead, the word says resides in you. So if that same power 
that resurrected not only Lazarus, but the same power that rose Jesus himself from the dead. That resurrecting power lives within you. That same power can resurrect you out of depression. That same power can resurrect you out of the ungodly thoughts. That same power can resurrect you out of the addiction and, and all the things that, has you tr that tries to bound you to this world. But the thing is, is that it's your faith that comes into play. It's the level of faith that you choose to have. Because I don't care what anyone says. The Bible says that God does give you a measure of faith. But through hearing the word, the Bible says faith comes by hearing. And hearing the word, that measure that's given to you now becomes increased. Amen? So a lot of people will say, well, I just can't believe because God has only given me this little measure of faith. That's a lie from the pit of hell. The more that you spend time with God, the more that you hear the word, the more your faith should be increasing. So if you find yourself not being able to overcome something, you should be listening to the word so that your faith can be increased. Let me tell you, God has really been doing something and leading me to pray a lot more. And I'm noticing that when I pray more, I have more strength to overcome temptation. But I notice that I, if, if there's a day that I don't pray as I should be, I'm noticing that I'm weaker when it comes time for the temptation. And it's harder for me to combat the temptation. So we have to put in the work. Amen. Because the word victory here in 1 John 5, 4 means the act of conquering something from receiving and obeying the faith that Christ imparts in you. Amen. How does Christ impart faith in you? Through you hearing the word, right? And through you praying, through the words of God coming out of your mouth, it's even imparting faith in you right? So it's not only hearing the word of God itself, but you even speaking the word in prayer, or you speaking the word in faith to encourage yourself will build your faith. So it's also very important that we make sure that we are exercising our faith in God and continuing to keep ourselves in the word. Amen. So what is the first point? And the first step to prepping for victory, obedience. Obedience is your first point in prepping yourself for, for um, victory. So obedience is your key to your success and your victory, even in your battle. The Bible says in James 4, 7, to submit to God, resist the devil, and he has to flee, right? That's a scripture we all quote. Do you believe that scripture, though? Because a lot of times the enemy will come up against you and you'll say, man, this devil keeps bothering me. This devil keeps making me do the, doing this, this, and this. If, you're, if you believe the scripture, submit to God, resist the devil, and he has to flee. If that devil is not fleeing, you can look at that. There's an area of your life that's not fully submitted. And there's an area of your life maybe that you're also not resisting the devil. If there is... So let's say you struggle with lust. Let's say you were struggling with fornication in the past, right? If you keep feeling lust come on you, you know, but you're still holding on to a little bit of pornography or you're still entertaining the thoughts of the past, of your past relationship. The Bible says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. So in that scenario that I just gave you, you're not fully submitted because you're still entertaining the thing that you're trying to conquer. When it says to submit to God and resist the devil, it means in its fullness. It, does, it, it means not holding back or holding on to anything, right? We see King Saul, he was stripped of his anointing as king, and he was stripped of his anointing of the Holy Spirit because he disobeyed God. He didn't disobey God in the fullness because God said when he went into battle to destroy the enemy, all his oxen, everything that he had, the enemy had, he told King Saul to destroy. But when he came back, King Saul brought some of the stuff that the enemy had because he felt like it was going to be an advantage to him. That wasn't the word that God gave him, though. God gave him the word to destroy and, and, and destroy all the spoils of the enemy. 
But because he did not obey God in the fullness, he was stripped of his title and he was stripped of his anointing. And that's what the enemy does to us. He tries to convince us that you can hold on just to a little bit of this and hold on to just a little bit of that. But once you give the enemy a little, you know, there's a saying in the Guyanese culture that you give them an inch and they take a yard, right? So you give them a little bit, but they take more than what you give them. And that's what the enemy does. He tries to convince you to just dabble in this just a little bit or just dabble in that just a little bit. God will forgive you. You know, you're a son of God. God will forgive you, right? That's what the enemy will come and whisper. But you don't realize by doing that, now Satan has a hold on you to control you. And this is why he cannot leave in his fullness because you're not submitted in your fullness. So the word says to submit to God, resist the devil and he has to flee. So to encourage you, if there's an area in your life where you're still maybe struggling, ask God to examine your heart to see if there's a part of you that's not fully submitted to him. Amen. So then there's another scripture of obedience that I love that's found in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses one and two. And it says, and it then shall come to pass that if you shall hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord your God to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command you this day, that the Lord your God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God. Hearken means to obey, right? To observe and to do all the commandments means to obey, right? So God says, if you will hearken unto the voice of God and to do his commandments, he will set you high above all the nations of the earth. Who is the prince of the power of the air and the king of this world? Satan, right? So if you obey, when he says that he will make you high above all the nations of the earth, it's a position of authority in the heavenly realms. So when you obey God and you obey his word, he now takes you from one level of victory and one level of authority to another level. So, when you obey God, he elevates you in the spirit realm. And now you have another up on the enemy in his kingdom. You have another, another level of authority in your ministry. You have another, another level of authority in your deliverance, right? Now you have a new level of fight against the enemy. The things that used to bother you before will not bother you anymore because God is setting you high above the nations of the earth. So he takes you to a new level in your authority, amen? So the word of God was put in place for your blessing. It's your guide to your success. Even in areas where you feel like you're being drowned out by the world, the obedience to the word is what will rescue you. We talked about um, Jonah last week, right? When Jonah was swallowed up by the whale, it took him being obedient in his repentance for him to then be, for then the whale to swallow him, to, to vomit him back up. So him to be delivered from the darkness of the belly of the fish, he had to be obedient in his repentance. So your obedience, even when you feel like you're in darkness or feel like you're drowning by the cares of this world, your obedience to the word will rescue you. Amen. So we even know about Moses. Moses was the man that sent, that led the people out of the children, that led the children of Israel out of the, out of Egypt, right? But Moses being disobedient to the word blocked him from entering into the promised land. God told Moses to speak to the rock and the water shall flow from the rock. But because of Moses's anger towards the people of God, he struck the rod with his staff and the water came out. God still provided the water, but the way that Moses got it was disobedience to God and his consequence for being disobedient was not obtaining the promise that God has promised him, right? So that's the same for each and every one of us. God has promised us things in the word and through the word of prophecy. But your disobedience will block you from obtaining the promise that God has for you. So obedience, the word says, is better than sacrifice, right? It's better to obey in the moment 
than to have to repent after. Like, and the thing that God has also taught me is that it's better to ask for strength in the moment to overcome the temptation than to give into the temptation and now have to be delivered from the effect of falling into that sin, right? Because the Bible says that um, God tempts no man above what he can bear, right? But also he gives a way out from every, there's a way of escape for every temptation. So no man can say that the devil made me do it, right? No man can has, no man has the excuse that the devil made me do it, but rather it's something read. If you want to know about how you're drawn away, read James chapter one that talks about you're drawn away by your own lust. And when the lust is conceived, it produces sin. And then when sin is even conceived, it produces death. So a man cannot say that the devil made me do it. You're influenced by the devil. The temptation comes from the enemy, but you have the choice to say no. And again, the faith that you have in God through receiving the word and receiving the word that now God imparts faith in through, that will give you the strength to say no to sin. Amen. So again, obedience is better than sacrifice. Um, it's better again to obey than to have to repent after. There's always this scenario that I always go back to about HIV, right? If you choose to sleep with someone outside of marriage, and you end up contracting HIV, you can ask God to forgive you and God will, but you still deal with the consequence of the action of that sin. So now you're still dealing with HIV, right? So now you have to seek God now on a different level for healing now. So when it goes to obedience being better than sacrifice, you're not only stopping yourself from the sin itself, but you're also pre preventing the enemy from bringing more things on you that you now need deliverance from, right? When you're obedient to the word, you're blocking the enemy from bringing curses on you, but not only you, you're blocking the enemy from bringing curses on your future generations. Or even if you have children now, you're blocking the enemy from bringing curses on your children. So obedience is the first key to prepping for victory. The second key for being prepped for victory is being positioned in your faith. So being positioned in your faith. First Corinthians 15, 58 says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. Your position, so this is also what God spoke. So you listen, I'm like Pastor Blaine. If God speaks something to me, I put emphasis on it because it's something that we need to hear. So in regards to this topic, being positioned in your faith, being the second step to your preparation for victory, God said that your position in your faith determines your confidence in the one who you put your trust in. So I'll say that again. Your position in your faith determines your confidence in the one who you put your trust in. So David was a man who was so secure in his faith in God and so secure in his position in God that he was able to stand before Goliath that everybody else was afraid of because he was confident, not in his own strength, but the one who gave him the strength. Because if you notice, <laughs> when David was presented before the people, okay, one more time. Your position in your faith determines the level of confidence in the one who you put your trust in. So I'll say it one more time, all right? Your position in your faith determines your confidence in the one who you put your trust in. So again, David was able to stand before Goliath because of the trust and the confidence that he had in the one who gave him strength, right? And like I was saying, David presented his resume before the people that he strangled the lion and he strangled the bear with his own hands. But David knew that it was not him. He knew that it was the God in him. 
So if God gave him the ability to conquer the bear and the lion, he was also able to conquer this uncircumcised Philistine, right? His position in his faith was determined in his confidence in the God who gave him his strength. So when you, when you know who you are in God, and not only who you are in God, but you also know who God is in you, the ways and the worries of this world will not grip you because you know who you are in him and you know who he is in you. Listen, fear can't grip you because God is not giving you a spirit of fear, but he's given you power, love, and a sound mind. Sickness can't grip you because he took the stripes on Calvary for your healing. Worry can't grip you because he gives you perfect peace to those who set their mind upon him. So if you know who you are in God, when something else tries to come against you, it will not be able to attach to you. I'm seeing right now in the spirit, it's like, it's like water falling off of a duck's back, right? Because it can't grip you because it's contrary to one another. It's like oil and water. They cannot intermingle with each other. When you are secure in who God is in you, when the enemy tries to bring a counterfeit, you're not going to accept it because you have experienced the real thing. Anyone who, any one of you ladies, when you, wear a, when you wear a Gucci or a Louis Vuitton bag on your shoulders, when you had the feel of the real thing, you're not gonna go wanna buy a dollar store version of it because now you have the feel of what the real thing is, right? Even uh, us guys, when you guys wear Nikes or these nude brand shoes, you're not gonna wanna get an off brand version because you have the feel of what the real thing is. It's the same thing with God. When you experience the true power of God, you're not going to want a counterfeit version because you've experienced the trueness of who God really is. Amen. All right. So those are the first two steps. Obedience and being secure in your faith. The third point to prepping for your victory is praising God for the victory before praising God for the victory. Amen. I'm going to say that again. Praising God for the victory before praising God for the victory. Amen. It goes along with the last one. Being positioned in your faith brings fotismo, right? You have to see it before you see it. I have to look at myself as healed before I'm healed. I may be dealing with cancer in my body, but I see myself as healed, even though I don't feel myself being healed. You see it before you see it. You praise God for the victory before you praise God for the victory. Before I overcome this thing and thank God for actually bringing me out, I'm going to stand on my faith and thank God for bringing me out before I'm even brought out, right? And through me praising God for the victory before it comes, now the victory will actually come. And now I'll actually be able to praise God for the actual victory. Amen. So if we, if we look at Joshua and Caleb, this was the, the story that came to mind about praising God for the victory before praising God for the victory. You know, when the spies went out to the land, everyone saw the land. And they saw the enemy as too hard to conquer. But Joshua and Caleb said, let us go up at once and possess it. For we all are able to overcome it. Right? They were able to see something that nobody else was able to see. Right? People will tell you, you're never going to come out of this thing. People will tell you, you're never going to be able to conquer this thing. Or you're never going to be good enough. But you have to not focus in on the things of the way the world sees something but you have to see it the way God sees it, right? We have to stop looking out of our eyes of what we see in the natural realm, but rather look from the eyes of God. You know, we are this eagle ministry, right? Like, every, like we talk about, we are the eagle ministry, right? The eagle does not fight from this dimension, but the eagle takes the enemy up to his dimension in the sky. And when the enemy is taken into that dimension, they can't withstand it because they're to be bound to the earth, right? The enemy is bound to the earth. So when he's taken to that next dimension, he's not able to withstand it because he doesn't have power in that dimension. It's the same thing with us being the sons of God and the eagles ministry and the eagles of God. We are to fight the enemy from the heaven position because the Bible says we are seated in heavenly places. 
So we are to fight the enemy from our place of faith and our place of position of authority in the heavenly realms, right? And not and start looking at the situation from the eyes of God in the heavens instead of looking and being bound to what we see here on earth, amen? So by first standing on your faith, you're able to see something the world can't see, and that's victory. And it all goes back to walking by faith and not by sight. Caleb said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. He saw the victory before it even happened. And that's the same thing for you guys. If you have family members that you're praying for, see them as saved, even though it may not look like it right now. If you're struggling with pornography, if you're struggling with lust, see yourself free from it now before you even see it in the natural realm. Let me tell you, everything in the earthly realm is governed by the heavenly realms. The, the, the thing has to take place first in the heavens before it can manifest here on the earth. So you have to fight for it in the spirit realm first, and then it will manifest here in the natural realm. So the other story that goes along with this point about praising God for the victory before praising God for the victory is the story of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah in 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 20. So Jehoshaphat was, a king, was the king of Judah and he was under great attack, right? The nation of Judah was under great attack. And through all these people that were coming and trying to overtake and conquer them, he first acknowledged God in reverence. And they fasted and prayed and Jehoshaphat reminded God of his word. So he was secure in his position. When you're secure in your position, again, you don't look out of the eyes of what you see in the natural, but you go back to God with his word. And you go back to God. If you're sick, you say, God, I may be feeling this way, but your word says though that I'm healed because of the stripes you took on Calvary. So because of your word, I'm going to stand on that and not stand on what I'm feeling right now. Because again, your feelings will deceive you, but your but the word of God will never fail. So you can stand on the firm foundation of the world and remind God of his word. And then God will manifest that word, right? So through Jehoshaphat being secure in his word, in God's word and fasting and praying and reverence and reminding God of his word, God then now spoke and assured them that the battle was not theirs, but the battle was the Lord's. And God told them to be still and see the salvation of the, of the Lord in verse 17. So then when it came time for battle, they remembered what God said to be still. But what did Jehoshaphat do? He sent the praise and worshipers first into the land. And when they did so, when, the, when they heard the sounding of the trumpets, when they heard the praise and worship, God sent an ambush against the enemy and they were smitten. Praise and worship. Let me tell you, your voice should be as a trumpet before God. Your voice, a trumpet represents the voice of God. A trumpet represents judgment. So when the enemy hears a trumpet, let me tell you, when the enemy hears the trumpet sound, he knows that God is coming back for his people. So he's put on notice that he's about to lose, right? It represents judgment. And when we lift up our voice in praise to God, we're proclaiming judgment against the kingdom of darkness. You're proclaiming judgment against the attacks and the assignments that the enemy has against you. When you lift up your voice in praise and worship before God, you're declaring that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Satan, you may, have, you may have formed the weapon, but I'm going to praise God and declare to you, Satan, that you may have formed the weapon, but guess what? It will not prosper. Your praise and your worship will bring you to victory. And because these people praised, they praised for the victory before they praised, but wait, hold on. Praising God for the victory before praising God for the victory. They praised God for the victory before they saw it. And now because they did that, the victory was given to them. So it's the same thing for you and me. When, because they were obedient to the word and praised God before they saw the victory, God gave them the actual victory. And they were still in God. And because they were still in God, it brought them the victory. They didn't have to fight. 
on their own behalf. They didn't have to fight out of their own strength, but they trusted in the word of God. They were, they were obedient to the word, right? They were secure in their position, in their faith. And because they praised God before they saw the victory, they were actually given the victory. And that's the same for us. You can praise God for the victory before you see it. And when you do that, God will usher in the victory for you. So those were the first three. The next one, verse the, site, the fourth point. I know it's getting late, so we're going to hurry up along. So the fourth point is ridding yourself of the blocking factors of the world. So the, the fourth point is ridding yourself of the blocking factors of the world. That is how you prep for victory. Ridding yourself of unnecessary weight, right? Soldiers, they don't carry two suitcases on their back when they go into battle because it's unnecessary baggage. They only carry what they need, the weapons, right? They carry their shield. They carry their sword. They carry their, their shield, uh, their breastplate, God, they carry. They carry the, the right shoes to be able to stand. And the same thing with me and you. When we go into battle, we should not be taking unnecessary things. But the things we should be taking is the weapons of our warfare, right? That are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, right? So we should be taking our weapons, but we should also be taking our armor to protect us. So the fourth point is ridding yourself of blocking factors of the world. So it's not only about wanting to do good, but actually working towards it, all right? So let me tell you, we always hear Pastor Blank talk about um, Esau sought the Lord with bitter tears, but found no place of repentance. So for Esau even, it was not good enough for him to just be sorry, but he did not have a heart change. He didn't actually work towards being good. So that's why he found no place of repentance. And the thing with us, it's not only about wanting to do good, but we actually have to take steps to work towards it. Because the Bible says faith, faith without works is dead, right? So if I say I love someone, it's not okay to just say it, but I have to actually show the person, right? And even today, God was showing me about talk being very cheap. And that's the words God used because I always use that word. So God, I always say talk is cheap. So God actually spoke that back to me and said, talk is the cheap. And the thing is, is that God told me that talk is the cheapest thing that you could ever buy, right? Talk it because guess what? When you when you buy something, you're exchanging money for the thing, right? You're staying it. You're exchanging money for the for the product that you're getting. So God said to me that talk is the cheapest thing you could buy, and you're actually buying talk because you're sacrificing and you're ex you're exchanging your integrity and you're exchanging your your your. I'll just leave it at that. You're exchanging, you're exchanging your integrity and you're exchanging actually being actually real for talk, right? And, and the example that God gave me about talk being the cheapest thing you could ever buy is, let's say that there's a homeless man full of pride, right? If a homeless man is full of pride, he can live in a trash bag. But when he encounters people, he can talk about all the cars that he has. He can talk about all the money he has. He can talk about all these things that he possesses when he actually doesn't. And people will believe him because of his words, even though it does not align to his walk. So talk is cheap, right? Satan will present himself to you, right? This is another example, a biblical example of talk being cheap. Satan comes to you and talks to you and deceives you and tells you that he's this biggest, baddest thing in the world. But Isaiah says that we're going to encounter Satan at the end of the earth and say, is this the one that deceived the nations? We're going to look at him and look at him so low in position that we're going to be astonished and say, God, this is the one that deceived the nations. And because Satan has to puff himself up, right? Because he's a nobody, right? So talk is cheap, right? So it's not all about us saying we want to do better, but we actually have to do better. We have to actually work out our salvation with fear and trembling. That word fear means reverence, but trembling means brokenness and humility. It's all an action.
right? It takes action to actually bring change. So guess what? The curse stops with you and your bloodline. But the key is submission or, and obedience to the word. Amen. Fighting against the flesh and not giving into the temptations and the cares of this world will bring you and your bloodline to deliverance, right? So you cannot give in, but stand on your faith. And now giving your life because Jesus gave his life for yours. Amen. That's how you rid yourself of the blocking factors of the world is by you giving your whole heart over to God, right? Giving your whole heart over to God, not just part of it, but giving your whole heart, right? I wrote a devotion this morning about Jeremiah 29, right? That scripture in verses 12 and 13 that says, then you shall call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you and you shall seek me and find me when you shall search me with your whole heart. So you will find God when you seek him and search him with your whole heart. It doesn't say with a part of your heart. If you want to find God in his fullness, you have to seek him in your fullness. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But he is a rewarder to those who diligently seek him, right? And you seek him by your faith. Amen. So. That's the fourth one, ridding yourself of the blocking factors of God. All right, we're chugging along, guys. We got three more. So the fifth one, committing yourself to the process. That's your fifth point of prepping yourself for victory. Committing yourself to the process. First Timothy 1.8 says, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy. This is what Paul is saying to Timothy. According to the prophecies that went before you, that you might mightiest war a good warfare. So Paul is telling Timothy here, the prophecies that went before you, don't just expect them to come and sit in your lap, but you have to war on behalf of them. Again, do you really think that Satan is going to allow God to give you a word and him not fight to steal that word from you, right? If Satan said, if God told you, you are going to be a prophet to the nations, do you not think that Satan is going to come and try and block you from bringing that prophet, because guess what? The words that come out of God's mouth concerning you, it brings destruction to the kingdom of darkness and it brings destruction to the enemy and his assignments. So Satan is going to come and try to block you from living up to that word. So this is why T uh, Paul is telling Timothy, I charge you. He says, I charge you. That means I commission you. I give you this assignment that you, according to the prophecies that went before you, you are to war a good warfare, right? So you are to, the word of God is a book of prophecies, amen? The word of God is a book of prophecies for you. You can have whatever it says, amen? Because in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, Jesus is the word. So everything that is in the word is in Jesus, right? So everything that's in that word, you can have. You know, I talked about this at the last Young Adults that I spoke out about something that Catherine Kuhlman said. And she said, if it's written in the book, you can sign for it, right? A package, someone sends you a package that they deliver it to your front door. You didn't ask for it. You didn't buy it. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't do anything to receive it. But when somebody gave you that gift willingly, and all you have to do is sign for it, and it's yours. Jesus laid down his life, and that was the package that came to your front door. He paid for it with his life. So all you have to do is sign for it. So now everything that the word has and consists of can be yours. All you have to do is sign for it with your faith, right? Now, just because it didn't come in your timing does not mean that it's not coming, but you are to war for it in prayer and obedience. You're not to give up when it, the going gets rough, but sticking it out for the sake of knowing that God will never leave you and forsake you and that he will perform what the word is set out to do. Amen. So that's the fifth one. The sixth one is taking expectations off of man and now placing them on God. That is your sixth 
step for prepping for victory, taking your expectations off of man and now placing them on God. Romans 3, 4 said, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man be a liar, as it is written, that thou mightiest be justified in your sayings and mightiest overcome when you are judged, right? So disappointments, they are rooted in false expectations, all right? I want you all to um, understand this. Disappointments are rooted in false expectations. I was talking to um, one of my brothers last night about this. And we are disappointed at times because we have a false expectation. We're expecting something out of someone that they cannot provide. So now we're disappointed because they did not measure up to the expectation that we put on them. So, and if we think about it, no man is ever able to keep a promise within themselves, but rather it's the God in them that gives them the ability to keep the promise, right? So let's say that, and I don't want this to trigger anybody, but it's an example that will go along with this. Let's say that your father constantly said that he was going to come around and he did not come around. And let's say he calls you up one day and says, I'm coming to pick you up. So now you have that expectation because of his word. Again, talk is cheap, right? He, because of his word, he said he was coming and he did not show up. So you had an expectation put on this man because of his word that he was coming. And he did not, so it was a false expectation and he did not come through and now you're disappointed because the expectation was on the man, right? And I'm not saying that you can't have expectation on people because we wanna be able to trust one another, right? But ultimately we can't trust the flesh of a man, but we have to trust the God that's in the man. We have to trust the God man about that person, right? If I say I'm going to come through, you're going to have to be able to trust the God man in me that I'm going to uphold my word, right? But also there's a, there's a, there's a, a saying by Maya Angelou that I live by that says that when somebody shows you who they are, you believe them, right? If you lie to me, guess what? I'm going to believe you're a liar, right? And let me tell you, I forgive everybody, but I don't trust everybody, right? If you sit here and betray me, guess what? I'm going to forgive you because I love you as my brother. But bet, better believe you are not going to be in my inner circle, right? Because I'm not going to sit here and put myself in a position of failing, right? You're going to have to prove to me that you're not going to betray me again before I can trust you again, right? So the thing is, though, again, is we have to take our expectations off of man and believing that man can meet our standards or meet the thing or meet the longing in our soul that we need but rather taking that expectation off of a man and putting it on God, that God will meet every one of our needs that we need, amen? And also another thing that we have to do, what I've learned from myself, is not expect ourselves from others. A lot of times we look at someone and we'll be upset with them and disappointed because they did not respond the way that we would have responded, right? But again, not everyone has walked the walk you walked. So not everyone can respond the way that you respond, right? So another thing is taking the expectation off of you, off of other people. Stop expecting you from other people. Let me tell you, that brought me so much healing when I learned this, to not expect me from other people, but rather take them for who they are. Love them where they are, right? That is how you will be prepped for victory. Because a lot of times it's the disappointments of people that block us from really trusting God because we have put an expectation on a man. And now when they have, when they have not come through, now we put that um, expectation on God. And now we hold God accountable of a man's actions. But when you take that expectation off a man and now trust God for being God and believing that God is the only one that can come through and the God man and other people will come through, now you will be able to fight because now the expectation is off of God and now placed on man, right? So our trust again should be in God and not man. God is not a man that he should lie, the Bible says, amen? 
All right, and the last point, our seventh point, is um, grabbing a hold of God when he grabs a hold of you. Amen. Isaiah 4, chapter 1, I mean, Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1 says, And in that day, seven women shall take a hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and we will wear our own apparel. Only let us call you by name to take away our reproach. Right? So these women represent seven church ages, and they only wanted Jesus to take away their reproach. They wanted to eat their own doctrine, and they wanted to wear their own covering. They wanted to wear their own garments, but they only wanted to use the name of Jesus when it benefited them. It's like a woman that doesn't want to be looked at as a harlot. She will go off and sleep with all these men, but just use her husband's name to take away her reproach as being looked at as a prostitute or as a harlot. But she will use her husband's name just for the benefit that people will not look at her as a heart. That's how it is with this. These seven women, these seven church ages wanted to live by their own. They wanted to live by their own word. They wanted to do what pleased to them. You know, the Bible says that he takes away our garments, the things that we're clothed in our covering. And now he gives us his garment. He gives us now the cloak of humility. He gives us the garment of praise. Now he gives us the robe of righteousness. But these seven women didn't want that. They wanted to wear their dirty apparel because they wanted to stay in their sin, but they only wanted to use the name of Jesus for their benefit, right? And if we look at that, we don't want to be like those seven women. We don't want to be like those, those churches. We want to grab a hold of God when he grabs a hold of us, right? We want to grab a hold of God because these people, it says, in, they shall take a hold of one man. So now they're trying to grab a hold of Jesus, right? So what I believe is Jesus has presented himself to these seven women and wanted to, to, to rescue them and wanted to, to win over their heart. But because they wanted to live in their sin, they rejected Jesus. So now when they realize what Jesus can offer them, now they want to grab a hold of him, but they still want to hold on to their life and their sin, but they only want to use Jesus's name to benefit them, right? But the Bible says in Revelation 3, 20, that behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. This is the scripture of Jesus grabbing a hold of us, him drawing us, trying to get you to come to him and have fellowship and intimacy with him. And sometimes we pass by that opportunity and then wonder why God isn't operating to the fullness in our lives. And it's because we wanted to eat our own doctrine and wear our own apparel. And the thing is, is that when Jesus grabs us and comes to us, we have to take a hold of the opportunity because if not, we will be searching to the ends of the earth, amen? Um, there's a scripture, let me look it up real quick, that comes to mind about um, a famine. And I believe it's in Amos. And it's Amos 8.11. Behold, the days are coming. Says the Lord that I will send a famine in the land. And it's not a famine of bread, nor thirsting of water, but of hearing the word of the Lord. And people will wander from sea to sea and from the north to the east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. In regards to this scripture, God has shown me that when Jesus has presented himself to people, they reject him. And Jesus is the ultimate answer for the longing in your soul. For your broken heart, Jesus is that answer. But when Jesus presents himself, people reject him. So now they've rejected the answer to their problem. So now the scripture says they wander to and fro. And they're wandering from sea to sea to the east and the, and the west. And there's a famine, not in bread and water, but it's in the word of God because they have rejected the word of God. They did not grab a hold of Jesus when Jesus presented himself to them. So when Jesus presents himself to you, 
grab a hold of you, even in regards to your calling. God was talking to me about that, that this weekend because I, I see a lot of people maybe up in age now that they're, they're, they, they're called and God has called them to a specific position, but they can't find themselves fulfilling that thing that God has given them. And what God showed me is that God presents himself to people and now people have to chase after their calling instead of their calling chasing them down, you know? And that's the thing, you know, God, God had me look at it with my own life. I didn't ask to be a pastor, but that calling God had on my life chased me down. I didn't ask for it. I didn't even, to be honest, I didn't even want it. But because I, I chose to surrender my life to whatever God has for me, I accepted what God had for me. I grabbed a hold of him when he presented himself to me. And that's why I am where I am today. And that's not to puff me up. It's just a testimony of what God will do for you and show forth through you when you obey him and grab a hold of him when he presents himself to you. Now, on the flip side, now these people who God has presented himself to them and they chose to not grab a hold of him in that moment, now they, they're trying to chase their calling. And now they're trying to chase their gifts and they can't find a place to operate fully in what God has for them because they missed their opportunity when God presented himself to them. Now, that's not saying that God will not use them in their calling and their gift, but the original design that God had for them. It's like they can't fulfill that position. Like, let's say that God called a pastor before me to be at New Life Sanctuary in my position. And God was tugging on them, tugging on them, tugging on them, and they didn't want to take the position. They didn't want to surrender. So let's say God overlooked them and now found and put it on me. So now I fulfilled that spot, right? So I fulfilled the spot that that person was supposed to fulfill, right? So now that's not saying God can't use them. It's just now God is going to have to use them in a different space, right? So this is why it's important that you grab a hold of God when he grabs a hold of you. When God is tugging on you, wanting to heal you, let him. It may be hard in the moment to experience the emotions. It may be hard in the moment to relive those memories, but it's all for the sake of God wanting to heal you, right? This is something I think we as the young adults struggle with the most is reliving the memory of our past and allowing God to bring up that hurt, you know? Because when God brings it up, you have to experience it again for the sake of overcoming it, you know? And I just want to encourage you today, that's how you're prepped for victory, by grabbing a hold of God, you know? Who said, no one said that your victory is going to be easy and it's not going to be painful. But when you come out on the other side, it's a testimony against the kingdom of darkness. So even in areas of healing and deliverance, if God is tugging on you and grabbing a hold of you, and telling you, look, enough is enough. Let me deal with this. Let me heal you. Let me show you what this thing really is. Let God do it. Because guess what? It's going to bring you to your victory. So your seven points of prepping for victory is obedience, number one. Number two, being positioned in your faith. Three, praising God for the victory before you praise God for the victory. Number four, ridding yourself of the blocking factors of the world. Number five, committing yourself to the process. Number six, taking expectations off a of man and putting them on God. And number seven, grabbing a hold of God when he grabs a hold of you. All right. All right. I'm going to end the recording. We're going to talk.